Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stanley Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And can you believe it? This is the last Friday in 2018. Going to start a new year next week. I don't know where 2018 went, but it sure went by quick. And uh, I think 2019 is going to go by even faster. So hold on to your hats. Anyway, we've got a great show today. Um, like last week, we talked a little bit about uh, battery storage on the grid. And um, our guest today, I have, I've actually heard him speak several times, but most recently I heard him about six weeks ago at an event here in Honolulu sponsored by the, the um, German Chamber of Commerce and um, the local consul general from, uh, from Germany. And um, they put on a, a, a program that was focused around hydrogen um, and energy storage uh, specifically, but focused a little bit on hydrogen. And uh, we had a great chance to listen to some great briefings and um, our guest today put on one of the best. It's um, Dr. Matthew uh, Dubry from uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, hey, uh, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And I, I almost, I'm afraid I'm overexposing him because he's been on a couple of times with Mitch Ewan from HNEI. Um, they work together, so Mitch had him first. He got first first dibs on, on Matt, Dr. Matt, but um, he's a really great resource to have here in the state, especially as we talk the more sophisticated or the more um, current batteries that are popular, which is lithium. He's, that's his specialty. So we'll, we'll try and demystify some of the lithium aspects and just talk about, you know, pluses and minuses of batteries in general, how they work, you know, things that you wanna you want to do. So Doc, good, glad to have you here. And uh, I know we've already you've already told probably Mitch's audience uh, how you got to Hawaii and how you got to work in, at UH uh, doing battery stuff, but. Uh, Tell my audience how you, how you got here. Sure. So, well, as you can tell from my accent, uh, I'm, I'm French. I did all my studies in France. Uh, by formation, I'm a ceramist engineer. So I have two master degrees, one in ceramic engineering and one in material science. Great. Uh, I then did my PhD in France, and that's when I started working on uh, lithium metal batteries. And after that, I really wanted to start working on commercial system and start working on larger scale. So I came here 2005. Uh, working for HNEI as a postdoc. And then I slowly rose, and now I'm on faculty over there. Mm. Um, we're doing mostly the diagnosis and prognosis of commercial cells. Mm. Uh, and that's because we really want to help eco, all the other right. people in the state that wants to put large battery packs to understand how to use their battery better and what to do, what not to do with those kind of batteries. And my guest last Friday was um, Ryan Wobbins from Burns and McDonald's. They're a large engineering firm out of um, St. Louis. And he's the, one of their electrical engineers. And we were talking about scaling up batteries. And could you just talk a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges or some of the uh, benefits to scaling lithium technology up to multi-megawatt, even gigawatt scale? Well, the, the biggest issue is that all the, when you build lithium ion batteries, they're all going to be slightly different. And that's just the manufacturing. And of course, the really high quality batteries are much closer together than the cheap batteries. But even the really expensive ones, they're all a little bit different. So it's not a big deal in a cell phone and just have one. But when you start to pack thousands of them, if not more, then you need to find a way to take into account all those small variations because they're going to influence a lot the performance of your, of your assembly. But even more importantly, they're going to influence how you're going to monitor it. Because lithium ion batteries, as you know, they, there is a risk in terms of safety if you don't operate them properly. Sure. And usually that risk increases when you have more and more cells because you have more and more parameters and it's getting harder and harder to make sure they all stay in sync and they all do exactly what you want them to do. So the main difficulty is to control them and monitor those cell-to-cell -cell variations. Okay. Yeah, we use some lithium um, cobalt technology in our vehicles. So we have some 14 kilowatt hour battery packs that we put in there. And, you know, to my surprise, um, probably not to yours, the cells are actually pretty small. They're yeah. like two C cells, yeah. um, our typical um, alkaline batteries, mm -hmm. two C cells taut on top yeah. of each other and all set up. They also have cooling. Um, so yeah. that's another thing that, that's, that's put in there. Is that part of the controls that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, because battery behavior is going to be really dependent on the temperature. And what you really don't want is having battery at different temperatures. And that's because if... They are different temperatures, some are going to give more capacity than others, and so they're going to get out of sync much, much, much faster. 
Okay. Um, the, the reason why they tend to use really small batteries is because they are mass produced. I mean, we're making billions of them every year. So they, their quality is really good and they're really close to each other. Some manufacturers, like I think the Nissan Leaf is much larger batteries. And then you run into issues because you make far less of them. And so you take the risk that they're going to be a little bit more different mm. than if you take two Bavos batteries that they're called 18650s. They're 1.8 centimeter by 650. Um, Tesla made the so choice to use standard. only, yeah, but it's a standard for computer and all mm. this, this, this kind of batteries. Tesla made the choice to use those. I mean, the Tesla Model S, there is 10,000 of them or something right. like that. Uh, so that's the choice of having something that's mass produced, so you know the quality is going to be there, and the chance of getting a less performing battery is pretty small. How about cost and just the, the logic of using batteries for huge, um, either long duration or for high, high voltages or, or high um, power requirements? I think for power, it, 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 it makes sense. I mean, the new generation of batteries are extremely powerful. Uh, for load shifting and all this kind of aspect, that's, that's a bit more um, debatable, depending on how much energy you want to shift. I mean, batteries, in the reality of things, batteries don't store much energy. If you compare that to, to hydrogen, I'm not going to mm -hmm. talk to you about that, but the battery don't store much energy at all. So it's really, really good for power. It's really, really efficient. But for long duration, that might not be the best for energy storage and yeah, large I mean, capacity. It all depends on the scale you want. Okay. Uh, for us, if we want to store for the whole grid one gigawatt mm -hmm. uh, hour of energy, a battery is probably not a good solution okay. for that. So let's take off on that. So one gigawatt doesn't make much sense. When you think about Hawaii, uh, HECO, I looked on, on their website, they generate roughly a gigawatt of power, plus or minus yep. up, you know, 20, 50 megawatts or whatever. And different times of day, they generate more or less, depending on what the usage of the, the, the requirement is. But let's just, let's just say, just to, for round numbers, they have one gigawatt requirement all day long. Mm -hmm. That's 24 gigawatt hours yeah. of storage, potentially when we don't have coal or other yeah. um, base uh, um, power. You've got to, if you had to use only solar, wind, or renewables, especially intermittent renewables, and you have to store power, you're, you're going to need way more than one gigawatt of storage. You're going to need probably five, ten, maybe even up to 20, depending on, on having reserves for several days rather yeah. than just Certainly. overnight. So, well, yeah, I mean, you can do an easy calculation. The, the BSS we have on the grid right now, uh, they have one, tr one truck trailer. But mm -hmm. It's fairly small, but still it's pretty big. And that's, I think the best one are probably around 500 megawatt hour. So to get to one gigawatt hour, you need 2,000 of them. Yeah. Uh, that's start to be a lot of batteries. And that's just for, as you say, for one hour for the grid. Mm -hmm. So if we want two or three days reserved for days like today where we don't, no, we, cloudy and rainy we're and not going to yeah. see the sun much, yeah. then it's, it's, it's too much, I don't yeah. think. Uh, to okay. me, that's not the solution. I think it's, it's a really good to have them for power and for, for instant access to electricity. Right. But for long term storage, especially if we want three, four, five, a week of reserve, uh, I don't think batteries are the right solution for, okay. for the task. Well, let's talk a little bit about, you know, batteries are amazing things to me. And, and I had the one slide I showed when you, when you briefed on, on that uh, a couple weeks ago. My only slide just showed basically capacitors up to pumped hydro and hydrogen and stuff, and the different batteries in, in between. So you had at the bottom end, you had super capacitors that are really powerful for really short duration. Then you move into the metal batteries that are, you know, a little bit longer duration and can still do a, a good power, power push or smooth power. And then you get into flow batteries, and then above that, you get into long duration batteries. But what, are, what is your outlook for the future? You know, I mean, I hear people say that lithium batteries are going to get cheaper when we go into higher scales of production, when we have economy of scale in production. But does that take into account where we get the materials and all the different materials that go into a lithium battery, at least by the current designs? So, for, you know, some folks have told me that cobalt is actually the limiting um, component in current lithium technology uh, because there's less cobalt around than there is even lithium. And then we get those, those materials from countries mostly outside the United States. So we get back into that. We don't control our own energy, major components of our energy system. Yeah, and, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, so on your first point, the, the power ability, the, the main difference between lithium batteries and, and the other kind of batteries is the, 
the electrolyte. And the voltage of a lithium ion battery is 3 point something volts. Uh, any other battery that's based on the water electrolyte cannot go over 2 volts. Okay. Because then water split and you, we're just making hydrogen and, and oxygen. Mm -hmm. so that's why lithium ion batteries are so powerful compared to the rest, is that they don't use water as an electrolyte. The big drawback is that the organic electrolyte we use is really flammable and leads to all those thermal runaway events. Okay. So that's, if we want safer batteries, we need a water-based electrolyte, but then we cannot go over two volts. Uh, um, to, to some degree, there are some, uh, some solutions to, okay. to override that. But uh, to answer your, on the cost, um, I think the cost might still go down a little bit, but you're right. The more battery we produce, the more we're going to be limited by uh, essentially uh, the cobalt. A lithium is fairly abundant. It's just really, really small. So to get to the lithium, you need to remove everything else first. Mm. Uh, but yeah, cobalt is coming from Congo mainly, which is not uh, a country that's yeah. known to be really nice to his, to his people. And so yeah, cobalt is going to be uh, a concern. But there are several battery chemistries for lithium that doesn't use any cobalt. Okay. Well, I, we talked a little bit before the show about um, the uh, lithium ferrous phosphate yeah. technology. Can you explain how that's different from lithium cobalt? Sure. So what people don't realize is that in a lithium ion battery name, it can be a large difference in terms of the materials they used on both the positive and the negative electrode. So most batteries, 99 point something percent, have a graphite as the negative electrode. And on the positive, there are five or six families of compounds that people use. Uh, one big family is called the layered oxide, and that's the one that contains cobalt. Mm. Uh, those are great because they give you a lot of power and the voltage is pretty high, around 4.2 or, or around that range. Uh, you have the manganese oxide, it's also really good, they uh, are high power. So if the cobalt is high energy, the manganese is high power, it's around 4 volts. And you have another family, that's the uh, LiFePO4, lithium iron phosphate. So the drawback of that one is that the voltage is much lower. The voltage is only around 3.6 volts. Also, it has less capacity. Uh, if you look at the cobalt oxide, I think it's around 160 milliamp hour per gram. Lithium ion phosphate is at 120. So it's mm -hmm. less capacity when you put them together and less voltage. So that's the drawback. The pros of lithium ion phosphate uh, are, are pretty significant. It's extremely high power. I mean, those things, you, you can put as much current as you want and it's going to work. The other huge benefit is that it's not as sensible uh, uh, to thermal runaway than the cobalt batteries. Um, the thermal runaway, it's a really simple process. It's just that the electrolyte start to uh, kind of boil in a way. The electrolytes start to decompose around 80 something degrees. And then the temperature slowly rises because that reaction produces heat. So when it starts, it's not going to stop because it produces on heat. <coughs> and usually in a cobalt-based battery, when the temperature reaches 300, it's going to strip the oxygen from the, from the cobalt oxide. And that's when oxidizes and it oxidizes. And then that's when the temperature rises really, really rapidly oh, okay. and the pressure and, and, and all of that. In the lithium ion phosphate, the oxygen is with, with the phosphate. So it's a much stronger uh, chemical bind. So you don't really strip the oxygen from it. And so usually those cells don't go into thermal runaway at all. And uh, I've seen videos of full battery packs of uh, LFP cells for lithium ion phosphate. You can put them on fire and nothing's going to happen. I mean, they're going to burn, but they're not going to burst into flame like the cobalt-based batteries. And when you have one of those fires, what happens when you put water on it on a... Um, people still debate that. I think now the, for the firefighters, they still recommend to, to put a lot of water on them. Um, just because what you need really is to cool the cool battery it. as much okay. as possible. Um, right. And I think for, for you, a, a really good tip. The, the great thing, if I can say about thermal runaway, is that at the beginning, that's a really, really, really slow process. Okay. So If you for, can interrupt it, then... Yeah, and for if, what, I, what I do in my lab is when we have a battery that gets hot, the first thing we do is we, of course, unplug it and we wait an hour. If an hour later the battery cools down, you're fine. It's not going to explode. If an hour later the battery is still hot, then it's started the thermal runaway process and that's when you need to, to act about it. Okay. So a good tip to know if, if your battery runs really, really hot, if you remove it, let it rest, it gets cold, you're fine. It's not going to okay. explode. If it stays hot, then you need to act on it. And I would recommend to put it in, in sand or something like that. Okay, they'll uh, cool it down. 
Well, sand is great because it's going to act like a sponge if the oh, battery yeah. leaks. Okay. It's not going to cool it down. Oh, okay. But it's going to act like a sponge, and sand melts at 2,000 degrees, so you're sure nothing is going to get out of there. Okay. So if you look, if you go in my lab, we have big uh, trash can full of sand, okay, just right. in case. Okay, well, that's some great advice. Uh, we're going to go to break now and uh, come back and talk to Dr. Burberry about some, uh, some more technologies and, uh, that he's working with in lithium batteries. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Come around every Tuesday at 2 p.m. with John, David, Ann, and me. We're talking about history, history lens. Right, John? Exactly. Seeing current events through the lens of the past. Absolutely. See you next time. Okay, Jay, thanks. <laughs> hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man here on my lunch hour, as usual. And uh, we've got a great guest today talking mostly above my head, but I'm trying to hang with him. Uh, we've got Dr. Um, um, you Matthew, I, I wanted to say Michelle, because most French guys I know I, are called Michelle, but Matthew Dubery from the university's uh, HNEI. Uh, he's a specialist in lithium batteries, and we're talking to him a little bit about just some of the different um, think characteristics of lithium batteries and the different kinds of lithium batteries and what makes them different. So I think it's, it's pretty interesting, but this kind of circles back around to what we are talking about earlier, where you, ha you can hook batteries up in parallel or in series, mm -hmm. and with one, you actually build your voltage, and the other one, you keep the same voltage, but you, you build more um, capacity. Would that be a fair word? Maybe you have, you have a right word for it. I'm sure I don't. But well, I, explain that relationship on, on how you hook up batteries to either increase the voltage or yeah. keep the voltage in. So by nature, a battery has a given voltage. And you might be surprised, the lead acid battery is 2 volts. Most people think a lead acid battery is 12 volts. Right. But no, that's 2 volts. And in your car battery, you have at least six that are connected in series to make those... Uh, to, 12 uh, volt. Yeah, to, to, to make 12 volts. So if you want 900 volt battery, you're going to have to stack them in series to increase the voltage. But then you cannot apply much current to it because you have one string of really small batteries. So then you put a lot of strings in parallel so you, you can increase the current you put, and you increase the okay. overall um, uh, power of, of, of the system. So that's where it gets really difficult with lithium-ion batteries, because if you, they really don't like to be overcharged or over-discharged. When you have strings in parallel, you always take the risk that if one string is different than the other, it might get a, a lot more current, or it might get, might get to a much higher voltage than the others, just to compensate for mm -hmm. the overall assembly. So most of the time, the control is at the single cell level, just to make sure that uh, no cell goes into overcharge or over discharge. So it sounds like fixing a lithium battery at home is, do not try this at home. I would absolutely <laughs> not recommend putting battery together without a really good battery management system and a lot of sensors everywhere. I mean, right. uh, battery packs are really expensive. Uh, and this is not just the cost of batteries. It's also the cost of all the mm -hmm. voltage, current, temperature sensors, and what's called the battery management system that's going to take all that information and make sure everything stays safe. Uh, I would, yeah, I would not connect lithium batteries with just wires and call it today. Yeah, that my, would be my electrical engineer friends hate hate when I say plug and play, because and, and now I have a better understanding of that. Yeah, part. and I mean, and the battery management system is still um, not great, and I, most the main difficulty is to monitor what's called state of charge. And that's pretty much knowing how much uh, capacity you have left in your battery. That's extremely, extremely, extremely complicated. Because mm. you cannot measure it directly. You have to use some indirect method to uh, measure it. And those methods, uh, they are really complex and they are pretty inaccurate. And I'm sure you notice that on your cell phone, where it's, when it's old, you think you have 30% battery, and the system says you have 30%. And a few minutes later, you have 2% battery. Right. The battery is fine. I mean, it's aged, but it's fine. The problem is the monitoring of the state of charge. And on a cell phone, it's not a big deal, but if you look at cars, 
Sure. And there have been cases where some EVs got stranded because the car thought it still had 10 miles, mm -hmm. whereas the battery was done. So understanding state of charge and monitoring it and recalibrating it with the edge of a battery is extremely complicated. And that's because the battery degradation is going to change depending on how you use them. So if you take two battery packs, you put them in the field, they're going to degrade differently. So you cannot really pre-record what's going to happen for that battery. Mm. So a lot of our work in Chenia is to try to find ways to diagnose the cells in the field and recalculate the state of charge. Mm. And we've been pretty successful in developing new methodologies uh, to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, we patented one um, last year or two years ago. Does, does some of the analysis include temperature? Or is it, is it I mean? Uh, temperature is not really an issue for that. And that's because when the battery is at rest, usually it's at time to, to cool down. And the thermodynamic potential of the battery is dependent on temperature, but not, not by much okay. around okay. equilibrium. So that's usually not the biggest source of error. The battery getting out of sync, the way they degrade, is a much bigger contributor mm -hmm. to, to the error. Are, are lithium batteries prone to um, degradation in super cold climates like uh, lead acid batteries are in cars? Um, or are they more resistant to that? I'm going to make a twofold answer. Okay. Uh, lithium ion batteries don't really like the cold. Okay. Uh, they, they're not going to degrade, but you're not going to get much capacity out of them. It's not degradation, because if you bring okay. the battery back up, you're the fine. The temperature, room temperature. Uh, yeah. In terms of degradation, actually, no. They don't degrade at all. And okay. As a matter of fact, and I know that's surprising for many people, battery degrade the most when you don't use them. Okay. So leaving a battery fully charged is going to lose maybe a few percent of its capacity every year. And that's irreversible loss. That's not self-discharge. Mm -hmm. So parking your, a car that's parked 90% of the time, if you park it in the sun fully charged, that's really bad for your battery. And that's because of a chemical reaction inside. And actually, if you freeze your battery, that reaction is stopped. Okay. So if you go in my lab, all my batteries that I'm not using, they're in a freezer. Okay. And that way we slow that reaction as much as possible so that mm. when we need to use it, the battery is still fresh. If we were leaving it on a shelf, after a few years, we would have lost 10, 15 percent of the battery capacity. Mm. So, that, so actually keeping them cold is good for them, except that if they're really cold, they don't get the power out. But in terms of lifespan, it, it actually it, protects them. Exactly. I mean, Back in the day when you could remove a battery of your laptops, I was always doing that. My, I remove oh, okay. a battery, fr freeze it, and uh, vacuum seal it, and put it in the freezer. Okay. That's the best way to increase the, the life of your battery. Okay. Well, what are some of the technologies coming on to get us to the next level of batteries? I mean, it seems like we're all looking forward to that perfect solution where batteries are lighter, um, they're more powerful, they last longer, they're more earth-friendly in terms of at end of life, they're not hazmat and things like that. What are some of the things we can look forward to in, in the battery world? So again, it's going to be a multiple fold uh, answer. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, batteries are getting 5% better roughly every year. And that's mostly for little, little tweaks here and there. We start putting um, a lot of silicone to replace some of the graphite. And that, uh, that makes it a little bit better. But it's not going to be amazingly better. Um, for that, we need to completely change the battery. And uh, there are two candidates that people are most focused on. One is a lithium air battery. And it's pretty much using air as an electrode, a little bit like in a fuel cell. So be okay. a half, one side of the battery will be a fuel cell, the other side will be a lithium electrode. Oh, okay. Uh, that could give a tenfold increase, uh, one order of magnitude increase in the capacity of the battery. But there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, the other candidate is a lithium sulfur battery. Um, so using sulfur can take a lot of lithium. So that could make, again, battery with a one order of magnitude increase in terms of capacity. But we're still pretty far from being available commercially. There's still a lot of fundamental issues to solve uh, to get there. And does that have a lot to do with the control uh, issues you talked about? With no, it's more fundamental material issue. The problem with the sulfur is that some compounds along the way when you put lithium on inside, some lithium become, some um, compounds become soluble in the electrolyte. Mm. And so they leave the current collector okay. and it's impossible to have them come back. So you're mm. losing a lot of capacity that way. So, so it's not reversible. For the lithium air, 
The problem is that you want your organic electrolyte for the lithium side, but that organic electrolyte is not stable against air. Mm -hmm. So how do you design your system so that you can have air come in against an electrolyte that's not stable? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of issue there. Uh, one solution that people are working on is to replace that electrolyte by a solid electrolyte, an electrolyte made of ceramics. Uh, that's really promising, but right now those materials, they don't conduct uh, ions quite fast enough. So they work decently at 100 degrees, 80 to 100 degrees. And there were some examples in France, some of the EVs we had, uh, and we still have, work with all solid batteries where the electrolyte is a solid. But they run 80 to 100 degrees. So it could work for EVs, for cell phones, it's not that much. Um, so that's potential leads that's going to make battery better in, in the future. Um, uh, I know one of the things that, that I've learned just playing with um, making hydrogen in the, in the office and stuff is um, that surface area has a lot to do with how much hydrogen you can make or you know, how much production you can get out of a battery. So when we get down to nano technology and one atom thick surfaces, if you can make them compatible, is that going to really help batteries? Uh, well, most batteries are already have some nano materials. Okay. Uh, the big problem we have with really small materials like that is that the battery liquidation is mostly because that electrolyte is not stable. Right. And so it passivates at the surface of a negative electrode. So more surface means more passivation means more degradation. Uh, so it, 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 it's a balance to find mm. between something that's more surface, you're going to get a lot of power, but you're going to see a lot of passivation. Mm. Uh, for high energy batteries, usually you limit the surface. You want larger grain so that you have limited surface and you rely a lot on, on the diffusion of the lithium through the materials. Okay. Yeah, it, I, I didn't catch uh, when I read your background that you had the ceramics background, but ceramics have always fascinated me. Well, in high school I did pottery, mm -hmm. so it was fascinating just to learn about yeah. glazes and things. But then my wife has a friend who worked for NASA and had space shuttle tiles and things like that, and I yeah. just, I'm just boggled by their feather weight. You yeah. put them on the bottom of a space shuttle and it absorbs all that heat, insulates it so that on one side it's thousands of degrees, the other mm -hmm. side is... Temperatures cool yeah, enough to um, touch. I, mean, I come from Limoges, France, which is a town that's the most famous in the world for its for, for the china plate. I mean, the best china plate in the world come from, from that area. So we we have the best European school on, on ceramics, and we do tiles, plates, all of that. But we also do all the advanced ceramics. I mean, you don't realize but in your cell phone, all the all the capacitors, all of that, they are ceramics. In your TV, mm -hmm. there's a lot of ceramic, and the battery electrodes, they're both ceramics. So yeah, ceramics dictates a lot of a lot of things and there are some amazing materials out there so do you think that having that background in ceramics really helps you working with yes lithium? and in all the methods we de we develop for to diagnose commercial cells we put a lot of material science into it and it's the understanding of all the what the lithium does when it goes inside the materials that give us a lot of information of the state of the system and by tracking those clues we can diagnose the cell perfectly without having to open them so that's a really uh, novel method we implemented. We started working on about a decade ago, and now it's well accepted all over the world. And it's highly recommended for people that testing battery to use that diagnosis method because it gives you so much information without having to open the battery or do anything uh, destructive to it. Wow. Well, believe it or not, we've blown through 30 minutes wow. here, Matthew. And, and I got to admit, I, I learned a boatload of information, Boku info, as we say in, in at HCAT. Um, so thanks very much for being here. I really appreciate it. And we'll probably have to have you back sometime when Mitch hasn't overexposed you and, uh, and can bring you back on ThinkTech on uh, Standard Energy Man. But thanks for being here. You're more than welcome. It's All a right. pleasure. And for everyone else, we'll see you next week, Friday, in a brand new year. Standard Energy Man signing off till 2019. Aloha.